All right, so welcome POI Community Connect um, to this uh, special session. We're gonna be talking with Amanda Miller from Encompass Health Rehabilitation Hospital there in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Uh, Amanda graduated from, in 2013, from Slippery Rock uh, University of Pennsylvania. She is currently uh, a senior therapist at Encompass Health for inpatient rehab. Um, her specialties include post orthopedic surgery recovery, neuro rehabilitation and amputees. Uh, her, or she is the uh, stop champion at Encompass as well, which means that she is the trainer for employees, uh, safe patient handling and body mechanics in the workplace. And she's also the leader of the patient satisfaction committee. Uh, in her spare time, she enjoys uh, health and fitness, uh, weightlifting, spin class, in outdoor cycling. I've had the opportunity to be around Amanda and she is definitely fit. So Amanda, what did I miss in that introduction? Um, I think you covered majority of it. Um, you know, just having a true passion to help people get better and see the small gains as well as the large gains as being a therapist. You know, finding that small reward for each patient each day makes a huge difference. And what we do and why we do it. And that keeps you going. That's a, that seems to be a common theme mm -hmm. as I've talked with uh, different physical therapists. That's the, that's the driving reason that, uh, that you all get out of bed every morning, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. So today we're going to talk about the process of recovery for stroke patients and then as a caregiver, what to expect and how to prepare. And then uh, the second part of the conversation is one of the things that uh, you mentioned in previous discussions was that the preparation of the house, of the environment after discharge is extremely important to continue the progress for patients. And it's oftentimes missed. And so this will be an opportunity to really record uh, your conversation uh, for posterity and allow it to be a point of reference for for your uh, patients in the future as they're going to their house. So that's the hope of it. All right. So what is that process of if if a person you know has a stroke? What is what is the normal progression uh, that you should expect uh, from a rehabilitation perspective? Well, first thing is it's not necessarily a linear progression. Like as you know, humans, we want to see like steady progress as we're going along, but you know, every day is something different. Your whole world that you are used to and your family is used to is completely uprooted. Mm -hmm. And it varies on your level of stroke, where it's at, you know, how old you are, but um, there is going to be a high and low of that stroke recovery. And I think that's normal with most things, but acknowledging the fact that we might have some really good days early on and see a lot of progress, but it might plateau or it could plateau there. And how are we gonna keep them going is the big thing as the therapist. Where can we see that small um, opportunity to change a little function here or there that they might not acknowledge right away or what can we change in their daily routine that makes it easier not for the patient or for the family member who has now become the sole provider? Um, yeah, for sure. So that's, that's a challenge that I think yeah, I wouldn't even think about is the fact that the, the caregiver is likely also the loan support, you know, the sole provider at that point because mm -hmm. the uh, stroke patient is recovering. Yeah, and you know, some of these individuals who have a stroke might be that sole provider for the family. So how do they take on that role of not only caring for someone, but also stepping into uh, roles within the household that they don't typically manage and are not accustomed to. And depending on age and stroke, uh, type of stroke, could that person who suffered the stroke help out with those things? Could they get back to them? Or are we going to have to find a new normal? 
kind of in in know. your experience are there some resources if if the patient uh, or victim of the stroke is the sole provider for the family are there some financial resources or anything that you could recommend that they look into um I usually reference them to our case manager or our speech therapist does a lot with it, but I know there's plenty of financial means out there. It's just the struggle with healthcare that people are probably starting to see a little bit more now that we're dealing with COVID is that you have to be your advocate, but um, there's definitely like uh, an assistive program that can be applied for. Usually there's something through jobs if the person is, working um, can they file for FMLA or some type of assistance program to get them back on track while they're healing or keep them I should say keep them on track or kind of um, assist with that process and then if the elderly there's like counseling on aging and um, home health type of assistance that is out there for caregivers that need more but I would have to reach out to get you a few resources for that because I don't typically provide it. Yeah, no, that's great. That's, uh, that's, uh, there, there are, I think the key to that answer is there are options that a, a patient could look into or a caregiver could look into to help offset uh, the losses there. Mm -hmm. So in that there, you mentioned that, uh, it's a it's a progression. It's not linear. There's you know some good progress and and what do you typically see as far as as a regression or a plateau? What are those peaks and valleys that uh, that a person might look out for? So maybe to start with, um, their kind of valley would be dealing with the emotional side of things, along with physical, like. Depression is huge as a secondary thing here that we see patients deal with. They might not be admitting to it, could be part of that denial. And, um, you know, getting down on the fact that they're not seeing the progression that they thought they would. Um, you know, thought things would come back sooner. But with that, you also see your highs of the small, small gains of your not able to put your shoes on one day and then you know now you're able to get your pants up can you stand long enough to help pull your pants up with someone else do you need one person now versus two like those progressions are huge i'm trying to get that little insight for the patient where i am with inpatient rehab you know as they progress and move towards outpatient those could change or when they get home, it would change to, you know, what their progression is, but. Mm -hmm. What are some, what are some of the normal exercises that uh, you are taking? Obviously it depends on the level in the situation with each patient, but what are some of the more common exercises that you're working through with the patients? Um, so most common thing to think about with a stroke is that the early on stages of recovery are most crucial. And up to a year, you can see progress. So the intensity of what we're doing matters. Our, like the use it or lose it principle, use it to improve it, repetition, all of those things gonna play into a factor. And also specificity, like is it important to my patient? And can they transfer this activity that I'm doing that might seem minute or mundane into something that matters into their daily life. So first thing, I'm going to try to get them into some kind of weight bearing position, whether it be standing, if they can tolerate standing with enough support from me and someone else, or does it just have to be while they're sitting on the side of the bed? And that can be enough of a challenge for someone low level can I get their arm out into a position where they're putting weight through that arm that's affected and you know everything varies but weight bearing is key can we send back those neuro 
that neurofeedback and signals to the brain to let them know that this part of the body has been affected, but we still need to work on rebuilding those connections, firing some synapses and getting the body moving again. Um, so, you know, weight bearing strategies, if there's any, no contraindications to stimulation of some sort. So e-stim at the shoulder or the triceps so that we can get those muscles to support and help us with sit to stand, pushing up, dressing, um, or in the leg, I will always go towards the dorsiflexors and quads or hamstrings to help them progress with the gait cycle or just standing. That's and true. simple as that is sit to stand. Like you don't think about it when we're good to go and on a day-to-day -day basis, but how many times do you get up and down throughout the day? Hmm. So that exercise alone is extremely challenging and very functional. So can I master that with them if they can? But if not, it's, you know, we're working on sitting side to side so that a caregiver can provide them help for that. And then also thinking of that cardiovascular component, like they're weak, they might have been in the hospital for a while. Maybe they didn't and they were fairly healthy before, but still thinking of building up that neuropriming type of deal and getting them on something like the new step or could they tolerate walking over a treadmill with a body weight support harness so that we can get the repetition and time and, and maybe not, ne not needing as much manpower to support the patient while we're thinking about that mental component of, am I gonna fall? Am I safe here? And not wanting to get injured in a different way. Yeah, I love that. that's a common, probably a common problem. Mm -hmm. where people just try to want to go for it and fall and that just comes with the stroke aspect as well of being your brain has been affected like do they all realize what has happened to their body some of them do some of them don't and um sometimes you're impulsive like i used to be able to do this why can't i do it now like why is my body not listening and working how it I'm used to it. So finding those little ways to make them safe and be able to keep going is huge. Yeah. So from a from a caregiver perspective, what what should they expect? What kind of encouragement? What what have you seen in your experience is going to best serve the patient in the recovery process as far as what a caregiver can do? Yeah, everyone is going to be different, mm -hmm. obviously, just kind of finding that dynamic between them, but just encourage them, like whether or not their speech is affected or not, encourage them to speak and allow them to have that time to process things that you're asking them. So thinking of an injury to your body, you can see a broken bone very easily, but you can't necessarily see the damage that happened in a stroke. And that's why it's hard for a caregiver to not understand why their loved one might not be picking up on things they're saying right away. So I might ask you to go, can you put your shirt on? And you're not doing it right away. And I, well, didn't you hear me, Russ? I wanted you to put your shirt on. And like that constant battering or questioning of someone could be very frustrating. So. Can you give them the time to respond to what you asked initially and then allowing that, that person time to process their request? Just slowing down and like saying like clear and concise directions. Make it be known what you want them to do. Um, keep it simple. You don't have to, you know, be all crazy about it, um, given directions. And as simple as it is when you're communicating to other people, are you actively listening to what they're saying? Like, did you hear what their response was? Can you kind of read their emotions of what's happening and how they're feeling with certain stuff? And 
whether or not the loved one is now in a wheelchair, try to be eye level. And I think that's something that as a clinician makes a huge difference and you can, can easily forget about it, but if they cannot stand anymore or they are in a chair right now, talking in a standing position and looking down on someone is very intimidating and can make them just feel not so great. They cannot get up to your level. So have a seat, sit down and face to face, make that eye contact and that's encourage. great advice. Hadn't hadn't occurred to me uh, about that. I'm sure most people, you know, wouldn't wouldn't think that. What other um, ideas or strategies do you apply uh, as it relates to connecting? Because it sounds like a lot of what you do is moral support, encouragement, as well as trying to get the uh, functionality back, the 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 neurons to fire can you find an activity or um, a personal interest of that patient that they like? Um, you know, some people, their motivation might be their children. Like they have kids at home or, you know, I like to garden. Can I get back to that? And um, can you make something, like I was saying earlier, that specificity, can it relate to something that is important that will be the driving factor for them. Can we incorporate those little things? Maybe they used to be an athlete. They like basketball or football, you know, making it engaging and entertaining as much as possible to have that buy-in because if I'm motivated, that's great, but I'm not the one that is going home with them. Like, mm. can I get you to have some success somewhere, whether it be big or small. And that's where, you know, like I said earlier, as a therapist, that's what drives us every day to come to work. That small gain and finding the potential to make it happen. Sounds like too, what you do is you celebrate those wins with the patient. I mean, they might not be excited about pulling up their pants, but we sure are. Or like, you stood up today, like, and they're like, oh, well, I want to be able to walk. Well, you know, you can't run before you crawl, like kind of a thing. So, you know, that progression of building up those skills again, it takes time. And being a patient is the hardest thing to hear. Like, it's going to take time for you to heal. No one wants to hear that. We want things instantaneously. But can they slowly build on it and get those gains? Is there a, a plan that's put together so when the patient comes in, depending on what their condition uh, is and their abilities, you say, okay, we're going to, this is milestone one, milestone two, milestone three, or how long do you normally have them in an inpatient setting? And what is the, uh, what does that process look like, I guess? Oh, over the last seven years that I've been treating, we used to see patients for, you know, three or four weeks. Mm. Four weeks, probably more normal. Um, average length of stay for a stroke is probably between 14 to 21 days now, sometimes more than that. Um, time goes quick. And, yeah. you know, the second they're getting in our door from an acute care stay, we're already starting to think about, like, things they need for home. And... Um, but I would say average, we have about 21 days. So, you know, depending on where they are, what are we, what are we gonna do? So how much can we achieve in that short period of time? Luckily in inpatient rehab, we're seeing them for a couple hours a day, um, optimizing that time with them and utilizing the family members when available to come into the hospital to get that early on um, education with the family about like, this is where they are now, this is where we wanna go. And then like getting them, family members to come back in prior to sending their loved one home. So kind of setting the standard of this is where we are, this is what we need. Um, and starting to get the 
the wheel turning for the patient and for the family member about, you know, what is your home set up like? What, what are things that are important to you? Do you sleep on the first floor? Do you sleep upstairs? Do you have access to a ramp if you can't get in, up and down the stairs to get into your house? Do you have a walk-in shower versus a tub? Like all of those things play a huge role. Like how wide are your doorways? Do you live in an old house versus a new house type of thing will make a difference on how wide that door is. So if you can get in and out of the bathroom. Um, so that's kind of where our thought process is in the background of like, how do we plan this treatment? How do we, you know, make this plan of care start and end where it's appropriate for the patient and appropriate or something that we can achieve. Mm. So looking at all of that. When, when you go to do that discharge, what is, what is that conversation? You mentioned several things that you ask and try to get a, an understanding about before sending them home, but what are, so what's the conversation like and what are the more common recommendations that you make when having that conversation? Um, usually if we're going to ask them and make sure that is someone available to help them if they would need it is like one of those recommendations depending on level of help that's required. Equipment for in the home, you know, you're recovering from a massive injury and your endurance might not be as good. Mm -hmm. Now, do you need somewhere to sit in their tub or in your bathroom? Maybe you're having trouble getting up from a low surface. So you might need a bedside commode or your bathroom is not accessible for you to get in and out of. So maybe that potty chair needs to be by your bed at night. Um, grab bars are something simple that make a huge difference. And that is um, probably one of the things from being an inpatient versus transitioning to home that I was saying um, kind of sparked this conversation was that our world is set up so perfectly in the hospital. They have all means necessary to succeed. Open floor plan, grab bars, no clutter, no kids, no cats, no dogs like running around. Um, there's no floor rugs and stuff like that. Everything is smooth sailing. So trying to think of those other um, distractions and home environments that you need to consider and maybe have to modify before getting there. So equipment is huge and that's where myself as a PT and relating with occupational therapy, we work closely on inpatient rehab to make that happen and get everything for home. So from PT, do you need a wheelchair? Do you need a walker? Is it a cane that you might need instead? Um, would I recommend a hospital bed for you? Uh, because you can't lay flat anymore. You're having trouble getting up from that low surface are just a few of those items to think about. Um, yeah, you mentioned walk-in shower, uh, a ramp. I mean, you don't think about, obviously, you didn't have a ramp in your house, most likely before this all started. Uh, no, and I mean, depending on how well you're functioning, from my side as a, as a PT, I want you to walk up your stairs if I can get you to do them. Mm. But how function, how feasible is it for a family member to help you if they are weak themselves or not comfortable handling you? And not only the patient's afraid of falling, maybe that caregiver is afraid of, you know, injuring the patient or something happened to both and both of them. Mm. So that is something to consider. Maybe it's easier to push them up a ramp in a chair. And that could be a temporary thing, or it could be something that's more permanent, but makes a huge difference if I can't even get you in your house to do all those things. Um, it's a, one of the biggest things to think about prior to leaving here versus going home. Yeah, absolutely. That's all very helpful. Now, what is the typical conversation between the 
inpatient rehab person versus the outpatient rehab? Is there a connection, a common communication? How does that normally work or is there <clears throat> conversation? Like, do I get to talk to their outpatient therapist? Is that what you're asking? Right. I wish I could talk to them more, or I wish I could, you know, keep track of my like little kids that leave me, you know, like my, my patients. But right. no, our communication mainly will come down to our documentation. From what I did in inpatient, you know, what are my recommendations for the outpatient therapist? Or what all did I see as an impairment while they were with me? So, um, you know, what, what was happening if they were up and walking? Does their foot slap? Do they need a potential AFO to walk in the community? Um, <clears throat> you know, what's happening at their knee? Is it buckling? Are they hyperextending? That's important for us to, analyze gait all the time as a therapist, but then it gives that insight for maybe that outpatient therapist of what, it, what needs fine tuning. This person got from being in the hospital to home and can function at home, but how can we clean it up? How can we make it look pretty? Minimize any kind of deviations that would, you know, allow the common eye to see as someone who had a stroke or someone who's injured. So otherwise I would say I would reach out to the therapist via phone or email if, but our caseload in Rock Hill here is so widespread. Like you might have someone from like Indian Trail, North Carolina down to Chester, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So you're spreading the map pretty large. Um, I feel like if more like someone that was in Charlotte area, you're gonna see mainly patients right around the city. So we don't ne necessarily know what outpatient clinic they're always gonna go to. So that rapport is a little bit lost in transition. Interesting, yeah, that, that seems that it would definitely be. So if you were a caregiver for a patient, how would you, I, got, I immediately think about connecting them. I'm like, okay, we're gonna have a conference call it's going to be you know, the inpatient and the outpatient. Let's just talk about this. So is that, would, would you encourage that or any, any recommendations that you might have as far as that connection? I think that would be great, um, especially now that we're venturing more into telehealth and all of these avenues are starting to come out. Um, yeah, I think it would be great even for if someone had a home health therapist. We had a conversation a couple months back about like, can we just, from when they leave us to go to home health, what kind of things can we leave them with and say like, oh, they did really great with this, or these are the exercises I really want them to focus on. Uh, I think if we could bridge that gap and utilize things like telehealth or webinars and stuff like this would be huge for patients. Like, you know, this is what I had struggles with as their therapist. Mm -hmm. I guess you could do a, like a three-way with the patient and the two therapists, or you could just do a phone call between the therapists like, and kind of say what, what struggles you faced with the treatments and everything. Yeah, does, does HIPAA come into play in that conversation communication? Is that one of the reasons probably that it's been more restrictive, you think? I would say that's probably why, cause speaking outside of terms is not usually – you might be able to get away with it a little bit better in like atrium system mm. because there's if they stay in CMC main and go to like an outpatient of atrium, then you're fine. But right. like I was saying, we're not necessarily going to one. So HIPAA probably is our biggest barrier. But if the clinic calls back here and says, hey, we have a patient of yours, like, would you be available to talk? And if the patient gives the okay, then I think it would be fine to do something like that. Actually, yeah, it seemed like that would be a good, good piece of advice for you know those caregivers to have to say, connect us, 
you know, mm-hmm. definitely want to talk. Keep us posted. Let us know how your progress is. Yeah. All right. So, um, so we've talked about stroke patient care. We touched on some of the things that uh, we need to be aware of uh, when going from or after discharge from your um, inpatient rehab. What else? What as it relates to stroke patients or really anything um, that would uh, help a caregiver um, better care for their patient? I mean, utilizing any kind of resources is probably the biggest thing I could say. And um, right now, it's kind of hard to say this because we can't have patients with visitors in the Mm -hmm. hospital. But while they're in a hospital setting, this is kind of your time to prepare the home and prepare Mm -hmm. to care for, um, because once they leave here, like, it's all on you at home. This is, I don't want to say respite care, but um, this is kind of your break to get prepared for what's to come. And I see a lot of caregivers want to be here at bedside, you know, all the time, day in and day out. And I think that's great. I, you know, full on support it. But also as a caregiver, you need to remember time for yourself. Um, Self-care is so important and can lead to burnout very quickly. Whether or not the patient can, you know, get around pretty much on their own physically or if they need a lot of help, you're still in day in and day out, like providing some type of care. They might not be able to drive right away, but, you know, they can get up and walk around the house. So anything they need, you have to do again. So... Like I said, self-care and time for that caregiver. So finding a resource, whether it be a family member or friend that could take the patient for a little bit, um, give you time to go out and get your hair done or go to the grocery store. Um, You know, sometimes it's nice to include the, the patient who had the stroke in those events. But, you know, if you're having a lot of, it's a new stress in your life and yeah. fine and just whatever it is that relaxes you or provides some kind of comfort and relief for a little bit is crucial. Um, and I think they, we forget about it a lot. And as care, as healthcare workers and stuff right now, you know, it's, you want to be able to do as much as you can and be around everyone, but you're, your health is just as important. And if that's who's relying on you now to care for you, you can't be the one to get sick. So finding a schedule that works for you and the patient to have everything worked out. That's an excellent point, right? The caregiver gets sick, then that's a, that's a spiral Mm -hmm. downward of uh, many more challenges. Oh yeah. Excellent. Was, this has been a great conversation. You are, yeah, love your personality. You're always uh, uh, so full of knowledge and, and great to talk with. How can we connect with you or do you have a, uh, any, any way that you would want anyone to uh, connect with you um, on Instagram or anything like that? I do have Instagram. I probably never post anything therapy yeah, related, okay. but I'd still be <laughs> like, I love to connect with patients and families outside of here. Like I just saw an old patient from when I was a stroke uh, or when I was stroke that had a stroke whenever I was here as a student at Encompass um, working at Sam's club this weekend. And I was just like elated that like, you know, I saw them early on in the stages and now seven years later to be like full in the community, driving, working is just, you know, one of those feelings that you're like, they made it like, right. got it back. Um, so yeah, I have Instagram. I'm, I text some people like I'm willing to share information via email, easy to send, um, information that way, resources, and that way I could get stuff out to you from like case management as well. 
with those um, like a, assistance programs or resources for caregivers? Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you again so much. Uh, appreciate you being on the being on the call and and uh, just grateful to get to spend a little time with you. Yeah, absolutely. It's good to see you. You as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So the good thing is I get to edit it from here, right? Okay. So yeah. I can cut it. We can talk. We can do whatever. <laughs> but uh, thanks again so much for taking you know forty five minutes out of your out of your day and sharing and and uh, you know you are you are serving in a new way in a different way this goes out there and and will allow people to um just have another resource things yeah to think i mean i was like i have no idea what i'm going to talk about <laughs> i'm thinking <laughs> i look i have been treating the one patient that we have here that has covid so i keep going home and showering so my I'm like, I have no makeup. Like my hair is like tied back. I'm like, this is not what I look like normal. <laughs> but I did not have time to go back. Um, but what I wanted to tell you is this is so ironic that you called me last Wednesday. I, um, I had applied to a PT position in Pittsburgh, like back in March, I wanted nothing to do with it. But my mom kept saying like, Mandy, you should apply to it. And I was like, fine, whatever. I'll, I'll please you. I had a phone interview with them and you called me in the middle of this like phone interview that I had and I got off the phone interview, listened to your voicemail and I was like, yes, I don't have to go there. Like I want to stay in Rock Hill. These are the types of things I've been like waiting for, like these connections here to build up like what, what Calvin's clinic has and like that is so unheard of for him to be like for you guys to be able to come here and instantly see somebody like I've always loved sharing the knowledge of that but I was just like you know God works in such mysterious ways and like timing is so crucial and I just was like Russ just called me with what I've wanted to do like something like this it's totally out of my comfort zone to get on here and talk about stuff but um I just thought it was very ironic and like awesome. uh, timing was so cool. You know, another thing we're going to do, Amanda, as, as it relates to these calls is we're going to do that amputee support group meeting. Uh, yes. I'm going to do it on uh, via Zoom. That'd be great. Okay. I hope that enough of them have some kind of smartphone technology to make it happen. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them do um, nowadays, but uh, yeah, I, it was, uh, we can use. I mean, Zoom's free. For, yeah, Zoom's probably the easiest that is out there. So, of course, uh, yeah. What's I that? Guess. I was gonna say Skype, but that's definitely like way dated, way a lot more dated than. Yeah, not, it's. I don't even. Is Skype free? I don't even know. I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I know we have Skype business here at work, but I don't. I don't have a clue. But yeah, Zoom's easy and I would, I think that would be great. I felt bad because I was going to do a bunch of stuff for Limb Loss Awareness Month and like we don't have any amputees in house and yeah, you but there's some cool stuff out there. Is that in April? Mm hmm So we didn't, it's, it's been a, it's been try, stick and move, stick and move, stick and move, you know, that's kind of been the progression of our business our business here recently yeah I mean it's hard you're like some days it seems perfectly fine and then other times you're like wow like so much stuff has changed in one month yeah and it will continue to change and adapt and I think that's just that's really the nature of life right mm -hmm. it's just always changing always dynamic and we wouldn't have it any other way it's just when when we have these major interruptions, it's like, oh my gosh, this guy's yeah. falling. But mm -hmm. we adapt. I mean, we're incredibly adaptive, and we'll yeah, so much. Is, we'll I work. think a lot of positive stuff can come out of it too. So, you know, like I said, telehealth is. Uh, this would be hard to treat somebody like this, but um, it's not something that's you couldn't do. It's definitely manageable. But that I think the connection for. Um, 
support group and like caregivers, this might be what we needed, like a little kick in the butt for not only amputee support group, but the stroke support group here. I mean, we've struggled for years because people just don't want to drive. Right. Or they can't drive. So like they probably have some kind of device or something that they can hook up to. And how many people are lonely and depressed? It's like, I get it. I was complaining about doing too many Zoom and FaceTime things with family and friends. And I'm like, I never talked to you people before. So why don't you <laughs> talk to them? And I'm like, it's nice. I'm like, oh, hey, like there's rest. Like I haven't seen them in a while. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But it's like, ah, no for time. I've seen you. I've seen you. I know what you look <laughs> yeah. like. Yeah. Well, cool. So we'll be we'll be coordinating that. I did talk to John Winter Road. He was the guy that was going to come down and speak with us at the last event. I have mm -hmm. connected with him, and he said that he would be happy to come on and tell his story. So we're going to get that cool. coordinated in the next little bit. I'll shoot you mm -hmm. over some dates, and if you can just let me know which yeah. works for you, and we'll make it happen. Yeah, I'll probably have um, this one guy from Hangar who is a bilateral up, upper extremity mm -hmm. ABT. Um, he's like a peer visitor from Hangar, I think, but he knows our speaker. So I'll make sure I can get him to join the call because I think he would be a, another like good story or avenue or be able to kind of feed off of his um, lecture, speaking, whatever he's going to do. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. The more, I mean, that's, it's all about education and communication and, and uh, helping people be more comfortable with their situation and learn. Right. I think that's what was interesting when the first one that I went to is the different tricks and, and methods and strategies and ways that people are, you know, the, the, the hairspray for. Oh know, yes. To stop sweating. Yeah. So, yeah, very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again. Uh, yes, always thank a you. always a pleasure. Thank you. Have a Have great good night. Bye bye. Good night. Bye.